Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our first class of this year's American Whiskey, I'm sorry, Canadian Whiskey Certification. We're in Canada, <laughs> we're up north. Um, thank you for your patience. Uh, we really appreciate it. So um, today I'm joined by Gina Fawcett and Dave Mitten. I'm gonna let them introduce themselves in just a second. Uh, but before we get going, make sure that you like us on Facebook, subscribe to the channel on YouTube if you're watching there. Um, it's PDXCW. Dot com. Um, on Facebook, we're at Camp Runamuck, Portland Cocktail Week, and Lush Life. Um, make sure to follow us on Instagram at Portland Cocktail Week and Camp Runamuck. Um, and then remember to comment below. We have a lot of great information for you. Um, and we're keeping an eye on all of your questions and comments in the comment section. So make sure to drop anything you want to ask Gina and Dave over the next hour in that comment section. Um, and it will go straight to them. Um, so I'm going to let them introduce themselves. We'll talk a little bit about what we're um, going over today, and then we'll jump right in. So Gina, take it away. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome. We're super excited that this is our second time. Uh, it was so successful last year that we get to run our certification, our full certification with 100 bartenders um this year and we're very excited to dive in our wednesday classes will be here live streamed with you and then our 100 students will also go through some thursday very in-depth workshops um before i pass it off to dave i just want to let you all know that this year we have evolved the course um to include ricky ramirez who's in the background in the shadows right now watching all of the chat uh come through but he has translated all of our quizzes our tests our application everything into spanish and he's going to be right beside us um watching the chat if you feel more comfortable asking a question in spanish uh, please do so. He's going to be translating that for us. And if you're not one of our 100 certification students, please also include your email address in case we don't get to that question live today. We want to make sure we get you that answer um, in your email. Without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to Dave Minton, our global ambassador. Thanks, Gina. Uh, and again, welcome, everyone. We are so excited to have you here. Uh, as Gina mentioned, I'm the global brand ambassador for all of our Canadian whiskeys out of uh, Hiram Walker Distillery. And Gina and I have been working together, God, since 2016 doing this. Uh, we head up all the education on the category of Canadian whiskey and obviously the brands we're going to learn about over the next month. And this was something that came about, you know, back in 2020 when the world was locked down. We were trying to think of a way we could uh keep educating and engaging everyone on the category and our brands and we set up the abcs of canadian whiskey which was a four-week course and that evolved uh talking with liz and the crew at camp runamuck about creating the first ever certification course for canadian whiskey and we've been working on it uh for over two years now so we're really excited last year went fabulously uh enough that we were really impressed with the amount of people that applied this year. Unfortunately, it's only a hundred at a time, uh, but this is why we do these four classes live. So anyone around the world can tune in uh, and the workshops are for the hundred students on Thursdays. So on that note, we might as well dive in. This first week is the longest, biggest week we have. So let's get right to it, Tina. All right. Uh, this week, we are going to dive into history and category regulations. So each week, we're going to have different topics, giving an overview of the Canadian whiskey category, uh, really teaching you about category as a whole. We'll also do some whiskey tastings with Dave uh, as we go through this category training. Um, but first, let's dive into the history of Canadian whiskey. So we're going to talk about some historical dates, some very important influential dates throughout history that influenced the category of Canadian whiskey. And first up is the Scottish Highland Clearances. So this was a time period where 
Many Scottish tenants were kicked off their land for various reasons, but their landlords wanted to use that land for other business purposes. So a lot of them migrated to Canada, to North America. And what they brought with them was their distilling techniques. So here's where we really start to see distillation in Canada and making whiskey kind of take off and gain some ground. The American Revolution then, uh, this was the British fighting the Americans. As you know, the British won that war. Uh, sorry, the Americans won that war, excuse me. And, you know, what do you do when you just lost a war and it's not a quick plane trip home? Uh, it's, it's actually a quite a long journey home for that war. You maybe migrate to Canada, not so welcome in the U.S., Maybe don't want to stay there anyways. Um, a, lot of, a lot of English migrated north to Canada. And you're going to see, you know, throughout today, especially the English influence on the Canadian whiskey category. So a lot of those British loyalists moved north to Canada. What they brought with them uh, was their knowledge of distilling wheat in particular. Next up, uh, the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. Now, during this time period, we see a brandy shortage in Europe. Those brandy drinkers need something to drink, right? Uh, so many whiskey categories actually, you know, took advantage of this. And C Canada was no different. Uh, we did see a, a spurt of growth in Canadian whiskey as Canadian whiskey was shipped across seas during this time. Now, the early to mid 1800s is a period of time that we call the Great Migration. And during this time, we see over 800,000 English migrating to Canada. Large amounts of English. Again, huge English influence on the Canadian whiskey category. What they're bringing with them? that knowledge of distilling wheat in particular. And that's going to become very important to what we call our traditional style of Canadian whiskey. We're going to jump forward to the American Civil War. Now we have the northern states fighting the southern states in the U.S. Most of the distilleries at that time, not all, but most of them, during this time period where the state boundaries were drawn, were located in the southern states. Are the southern states going to share their whiskey with the northern states? Oh no, no they are not during this time. But also not many distilleries survived the Civil War. You know, many people, first of all, their workforce went to war, so they didn't have anyone making whiskey in some of these distilleries, but also a lot of the equipment was melted down for war purposes, ammunition, et cetera. So not a lot of distilleries survived this period in the US. The ones that did, most of them were in the South, not sharing with the North. The Northerners, what did they do? They went to Canada for their whiskey. And here's where we see, you know, the mid 1800s is where we really see the biggest growth period in Canadian whiskey in history to this day, the mid 1800s. And after the Civil War, now we see the US becoming the largest customer of Canadian whiskey. And that remains true today. Jumping forward to prohibition, now most people think, you have saw a movie or two, I'm sure. Prohibition. This was the time for Canadian whiskey, all the smuggling and the glamour and the drama. Um, not so much. If your biggest customer, we just said biggest customer, U.S., your biggest customer of your product can't legally purchase your product. Unfortunately, as a category, it's not going to go too well. And it didn't for many, many distilleries. Now, there were a few that thrived. Those stories are true to some extent. Uh, and the Hiram Walker Distillery, the whiskeys we're all tasting through are coming out of the Hiram Walker Distillery. The Hiram Walker Distillery was one of those distilleries that thrived. And we'll talk about that a bit later. 
But for the most part, when we're talking about Canadian whiskey as a category, we see a huge decline here um, because the biggest customer, you know, could not purchase the product. And then post prohibition, now your biggest customer can legally purchase your product. They don't have a lot of aged whiskey hanging out, but Canada does. Those distilleries that did thrive, they've got some aged whiskey and they are ready to go. So here we go, take off on growth of the category once again, post prohibition. So that traditional style I touched on, very much influenced by the English and the wheat grain. So here we see Thomas Molson, part of the Molson family. We all know the Molson beer, yeah? Still, still out and about today. Uh, they were a beer brewing uh, family. However, Thomas, one of the sons, decided to sidetrack and, and start his own business. He really wanted to start a distillery. So he opened up his distillery in 1821. This was the first commercial distillery in Canada. He was distilling wheat. That's what the English knew what to distill. So the first commercially mass produced whiskeys in Canada were wheat. And if we think about wheat as a grain, it's a very, you know, it's a lighter grain. It's a softer, somewhat sweeter grain, right? So we're kind of setting the tone of what will become that traditional style. In the 1800s, we see a train system being built across Canada from coast to coast. What happens when you're connecting people? You're connecting ideas. Lots of industries saw innovation happening. New products coming to life. For whiskey in particular in Canada, we also saw the Germans migrating on the East Coast, much like they did in the US. Also on the West Coast, after the California gold rush, they moved North. There was another gold rush near Vancouver. What the Germans brought with them was their knowledge on distilling rye. And rye grows really well in Canada. It's cold up there. And rye grows great in that environment. So now we start to see the English putting just a little bit, like five to 10% rye into their wheat whiskeys. So if you were lucky enough to go to a saloon and see two barrels of whiskey on the back bar, you would have either asked for a whiskey, which would have been 100% wheat, or you would have asked for a rye, which was mostly wheat with maybe five to 10% rye. Today, to this day, in for Canadian whiskey, if someone calls a rye, they don't necessarily mean a whiskey that's primarily made of rye, big, bold, spicy whiskey. What they're referring to is this traditional style, primarily corn, a little bit of rye, a Ryan Coke, that's the style they're really looking for, is uh, the traditional style, lighter, softer, sweeter, with a little punch at the end. Now, eventually, the English um, changed from wheat, or the Canadians, I should say, who were mostly English, those distillers first, um, changed from wheat to corn. They got their hands on corn from the US, and they started growing it themselves. Corn has a much higher yield, larger starch con uh, content in the grain, which at, in the, at the end of the day results in uh, higher alcohol yield. It's also a light, soft, even sweeter than wheat, but sweet grain. So now that traditional style today, when we talk about Canadian whiskey, what someone really has in the back of the, the style they have kind of in the back of their head is primarily corn with a touch of rye. And that's really what people um, refer to as Canadian whiskeys. Now there's a breadth of styles beyond this, but this is what we're gonna call our traditional style. Next up is our whiskey barons. So these are some incredible, 
incredibly influential people at the beginning of the major whiskey growth of the category. Now, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are the people that influenced a lot of the whiskeys that you'll be tasting through in the next four weeks. We have William Guterham and James Wartz Sr. Pictured there is Mr. Guterham. Unfortunately, we cannot find a picture of James Ward Sr. Uh, we have J.P. Weiser. We have Henry Corby. And we have Hiram Walker. So William Guterham and James Ward Sr. were brothers-in-law. They migrated from England, again, that English influence, to the town of York, which is today... Toronto. It's a, it's a neighborhood in Toronto. Um, the distillery district is where the Guterham and Wartz distillery stood. Um, but they migrated to Toronto, present day Toronto. Now they were grain millers. They started a grain milling business and they had many other trades incredibly influential in the community, which Dave's going to talk about a little bit later uh, in more depth in the whiskey tasting. But if you think about that time, we're, we're talking the 1800s here, early, you know, first quarter to before the first half of the 1800s. This was money existed, but primarily it was a bartering system. So the farmer brought his grain to be milled. And for payment, you know, they would give the farmer back about, depending on the agreement, let's say 90% of milled grain, and they kept about 10% for themselves as payment. Uh, they soon began stockpiling a lot of milled grain and needed to preserve it. So they decided in 1837 to start distilling. Now this really took off for them. Uh, they became very good at distilling, distilling multiple grains, you know, what, whatever was being farmed in the area. And by 1850, 46, 1846, they had an employee with the last name of Riley, and he created a double column still. So, you know, when they were distilling in the 1800s, it wasn't as smooth, soft, gentle as a product as we might taste today. Um, but Mr. Riley patented this still that took the liquid through a second column distillation. Now he wasn't the first to invent double column distillation. There were, there were many others uh, influential throughout the world. Aeneas Coffee was one, um, but this really for Canadian whiskey changed what it would eventually that traditional style would become, become known as and known for being very light, soft, right? By 1877, so remember, Civil War, we now have the biggest growth period in Canadian whiskey category. U.S. is the biggest customer. By 1877, the Guterham and Wars Distillery was the largest in the world. Major growth. Based on their timing, they were set up for success when that growth period hit. Next up is J.P. Weiser. He was an American, lived in upstate New York. Uh, he was also a cattle breeder. Now, J.P. Weiser had a very large cattle breeding business. He had ranches as far as Kansas, as far south as Florida. He breeded many, many cattle. And he was not really interested in making whiskey. He was really interested in the spent grain at the bottom of the still after distillation. Because that spent grain, it has a lot of nutrients for animal feed. And what he realized was a distillery that use high, uses high quality grains that spent grain is high quality and he can breed larger cattle. So he moved up to Canada and purchased his uncle's distillery in 1857. And he left the breeding business to his son. Now, he did become interested in making whiskey. 
Um, and by 1893, we started to see the first bottles of J.P. Weiser's sold in the U.S. at the Chicago's World Fair. Now, Henry Corby, Englishman as well, uh, he migrated to Belleville, Ontario. He was a baker. He was also a miller. He also transported grain through the waterways, uh, the St. Lawrence Seaway. So, you know, this, all of these guys had multiple trades going on. Um, but again, back to that bartering system, starting to collect some milled grains. So by 1859, he distilled his first whiskey at Alma Mills, which eventually became known as the Corby Distillery. Through time, a town grew around the distillery and the town became named Corbyville after Henry Corby. And finally, we have Hiram Walker. He was an American, uh, lived in the New England States and moved to Detroit, Michigan. He was a grocer. And if you're familiar with Detroit at all, his grocery store actually would have sat uh, where the GM building sits today, downtown. So, you know, when we look at a lot of whiskey categories, quite often some historical iconic blenders were first grocers. And it's like, what is the connection here? Again, back to that bartering system. You have a lot of farmers distilling their own whiskey on their farms from their leftover grains, bringing their whiskey to the grocery store in exchange for goods to bring back home for their family. As a grocer, you need to figure out this product isn't so consistent from bottle to bottle. Not all of it tastes great, some maybe. You need to figure out how to blend it in a way that you have a very sellable product and very consistent product. And that's what he did. Now he wanted to start his own distillery. And in 1858, he did that, but he did not do that in Detroit, Michigan. He did that in Windsor, Ontario, which is right across the river from Detroit. The distillery still stands there today, right on the river. You can stand on one side in Detroit and look at the distillery on the other side of the river. But there's a, he, he still lived in Detroit and there was a very uh, important reason that he did not build his distillery in Detroit, Michigan in 1858. Two reasons actually. The first one being there was a temperance movement at that time that was gaining a lot of momentum. So one reason that your distillery could be shut down, possible prohibition on the horizon. Second reason being, there was talk of the Civil War. You know, back then you didn't just surprise attack, you talked about war for years. So two reasons your distillery could be shut down if it was built in the United States at that time. So he looked across the river and decided, I will build it there. We like to call him the first commuter. I don't know if that's true, but it's fun to say. Uh, so present day, you know, this is the longest uh, producing distillery in Can Canada, longest continuously producing distillery. And today it is one of the largest distilleries in North America. I've got a little hold on my, there we go. Okay, so let's touch on uh, aging whiskey. Canada was the first country to mandate a minimum aging requirement. Most people would think it was Scotland. I did, or Ireland, maybe somewhere in Europe. Uh, but actually it was Canada. Let's look at the evolution of that. In 1887, Canada mandated a one year aging law. Why, what prompted this? Well, if we look back at our whiskey barons, okay, uh, they were not only distillery operators and owners. Like I said, they were very influential in their communities. They were 
politicians, lawmakers, community leaders. But they also saw this growth, this massive growth in the category happening in that mid 1800s and through the late 1800s. And they see all these little distilleries popping up. Craft distilleries, macro, micro distilleries, what we'd call them today, but taking a little piece out of the business. So by 1887, they decided those little guys, most of them can't afford to hold on to the inventory for an entire year. They need to make whiskey, get it out the door, cash flow. So they put in a one year minimum aging law for Canadian whiskey. And that took care of a good chunk of, of the competition. However, by 1890, they upped that to two years. And by, the, by 1900, we, we really see the category going from having over 200 distilleries to less than 20. So they really took out their competition. <laughs> Now, there was also other reasons, um, money, taxes for Canada. You know, there, there's lots of things that come into play, but that is a major reason for the evolution of the age requirements in Canada. In 1974, they moved to a three-year minimum aging uh, requirement, much like scotch. Their aging requirements to this day are much like scotch whiskey. And finally, we're going to touch about, uh, talk about Prohibition. So kind of going back, let's really examine that time period. This guy is Harry Hatch. Uh, he was a salesman for the Corby Distillery in the early 1900s. He also owned a bar in Oshawa. So if you look at this map and just northeast of Toronto, you'll see Oshawa. That was where Harry Hatch owned a bar. His primary customers in his bar were fishermen who traveled across Lake Ontario back and forth between New York and Canada. And so Harry, clever Harry, decided to employ uh, these fishermen to sell Corby's whiskey during Prohibition to sneak cases of whiskey on their fishing boats no one su would suspect sell them in new york and and take a little piece of the profit as payment hugely successful massively successful so he goes to the owner of the corby distillery at the time his name was mortimer davis and says look what i'm doing for you all these distilleries are closing and you are thriving i want a piece of this pie and Mortimer Davis says, absolutely not. So Harry Hatch leaves, he quits. He takes out a loan and he purchases the Guterham and Wartz Distillery, moves all of that business to the Guterham and Wartz Distillery. Massively successful. So successful, he did that in 1923. By 1926, he was able to purchase the Hiram Walker Distillery for $14 million in cash. It was actually valued at $28 million, but he was able to purchase it for $14 million in cash in 1926. Again, massively successful. He then went back to Mortimer Davis and said, I'm going to buy your distillery because he wasn't doing so well at that time. Mortimer Davis had bought the J.P. Weiser's distillery in the meantime so therefore, Harry Hatch also purchased the J.P. Weiser's brand. All of those whiskeys, not those exact whiskeys that were made then, but the influence of those whiskeys, um, all of the whiskeys are made now at the Hiram Walker Distillery in Windsor, Ontario. Okay, so we're going to look back at our timeline that we had up right up front in the beginning of this and see where this all sits. Just to give you a visual of how important the mid 1800s were to the growth of the category. You can see now Thomas Molson, his distillery didn't last long, but the rest of them 
you know, really set up for success moving into the Civil War time period. And then that massive growth through the 1800s. And we see those minimum aging requirements coming in toward the end of the 1800s. And by 1900, the big five control the market. Now, by the big five, we mean Guterham and Wartz, J.P. Weiser, Hiram Walker, Henry Corby, and Mr. Seagram. And then we see uh, where Harry Hatch fits. He comes into the picture a little later, but he really set up the Hiram Walker Distillery um, and his brands at the time for success during Prohibition, but also after Prohibition. Okay, so I am going to give it back to Dave, and he's going to take us through a couple of whiskeys. Dave? Thanks, Gina. Uh, hope you guys like that. That was a nice little highlight of the history of Canadian whiskey. And Gina, you did a fantastic job. Um, obviously, we really focused on a lot of our brands and our history. Um, but tomorrow, you'll get to meet Davin de Kergamo, the writer of the new Portable Expert Canadian Whiskey. And he'll probably talk about a uh, bigger, broader scale of Canadian history. So... That Harry Hatch, my God, I think there needs to be a movie. Someone needs to call uh, Martin Scorsese's, call it Hatch's Navy. There's a movie waiting somewhere. But right now, we're going to try two different whiskeys. One, your first one, your J.P. Weiser's 10-year-old, or you guys have the little little guys like this in your kit. Um, this is exciting. We didn't have this whiskey in the course last year. This was something we developed uh, about six years ago for the European market. And it's been doing so well that we just recently launched it in the U.S. last fall and in Canada right before the holidays this December. Um, so it's fairly new to the market in North America. Hopefully we'll see if you guys like this. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. We're going to taste it together. Now, one thing Gina, Don, and I completely agree on is I'm going to give you some of my tasting notes and what I think, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to smell and taste the same thing as well. So please, while we're doing it, if you want, chime in. Tell us what you're smelling. Tell us what you're nosing. Tell us what you're tasting. Um, so as Gina mentioned, this is a traditional style Canadian whiskey. And feel free to ask all the questions you want during this, but also keep in mind in the next four weeks, we are deep diving with Myself, Gina, our head distiller, Amy Labesque, and master blender, uh, Don Livermore, we're going to be answering every question about fermentation, distillation, aging throughout the next few weeks. Um, I think Gina touched on it, but if you hear the words Canadian whiskey, what do you think the main ingredient would be? Anyone? Well, the normal answer is a lot of people generally think Canadian rye whiskey that's what it's called. Now, we don't have the same rules and regulations as the U.S., which we'll get into. Maple syrup, good one, Wallace. I like that. Corn, there you go. Traditional Canadian whiskey, the majority ingredient is corn. Uh, it's generally a really soft double column distilled corn. Uh, one run through the column still strips away a lot of the big harsh qualities from the grain and yeast. Second run to the still takes away a lot of the bit harsh big flavors from the grain and yeast, and you're left with this light-styled whiskey. As Gina touched, as Gooderham and Warts started that process uh, in the 1800s, it became a tradition for Canadian whiskey. So we can distill in any way we choose. At Hiram Walker, most of our corn is double column distilled. So that's the majority of this whiskey. Uh, there is also a once column distilled rye in this whiskey. And there's about 10% rye in this Canadian whiskey, obviously 90% corn. Traditional style Canadian whiskey, a lot of the time it'll be less than 1% rye included. Uh, very light style. So, I mean, nosing it right away. I always get like a bit of creme brulee off this, but it's not too powerful. It's got a soft sweetness. It's aged in three types of casks. So, it's three distillates. You've got Corn aged and brand new American oak, and you're going to get all the lovely vanilla, toffee, caramel uh, flavors from that. You have Canadian whiskey, or sorry, you have corn whiskey aged in Canadian whiskey casks. And what that is, is 
a cask that we have purchased from the U.S. We buy up X bourbon casks. We'll age in those, and once we use them again, it's considered a Canadian whiskey cask. Accentuates a lot of the green, grain and yeast characteristics to the blends. And then thirdly, we use X bourbon casks. The rye is uh, blended, sorry, aged in the X bourbon. Minimum age in this blend is 10 year. That is a rule. And no, the rye is not malted. And this is traditional. So I'm getting creme brulee. I'm getting the soft, sweet creaminess. First sip, it's what you think of when you think of Canadian whiskey. Very light. I'm getting vanilla. I'm getting like autumn spices off this from the ex-Canadian whiskey casks. Really easy. On its own, it's great. Gina and I often recommend in a boiler maker side of light beer. Or if you're making cocktails, usually light styled cocktails, highballs, tall, refreshing drinks, egg custard. I like that. Mm. I was going to, I was going to add the, uh, the boiler maker comment. We always, both of us like this alongside a beer. Toasted marshmallow. I like that as well. Mm -hmm. Definitely some apple pie, but I mean, no one's wrong. Whatever you're getting is right. Is everyone enjoying this one? Or has anyone not had a traditional Canadian whiskey? I mean, you think a lot of the big names. J.P. Weiser's is one of the biggest names in Canada uh, for Canadian whiskey. We're, 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 we're working on the U.S. and overseas right now. We've got a way to go, but we're doing pretty well. Well, it is the second largest brand in the, uh, in the world sold. Oh, yeah. Which is pretty cool. Of Canadian whiskey. Yeah. I should probably move on to the next one. Yeah, let's do it. All right. So next up, you just had traditional style. We are going to hit the Gooderham and Warts. As Gina was talking about, the gents from Suffolk, England that made their way to the town of York in the mid-1800s. Uh, she gave you a little spiel on the distillery, how they were grain millers and started distilling whiskey and uh, double column distillation. Uh, by the year 1877, this is stuff we don't learn in school growing up in Canada, but they had become the largest distillery in the world by 1877, producing 2.5 million gallons annually. Uh, with this, they do, started doing quite well for themselves. They were actually Canada's first taxpayers. Canada was a country for 10 years before we were paying taxes. They were the first, J.P. Weiser, Henry Corby, Hiram Walker, they were all the first taxpayers. So when you meet Dr. John, our master blender, if he gets into this, he will talk about how Canadian whiskey helped build Canada. I mean, Gooderham and Warts were on our money, our currency at one point. You've seen our funny plastic colored money. Uh, they were on our currency at one point. I think they should be on there all the time now, all Canadian whiskey producers, if they help build the country. Gooderham and Warts, uh, specifically downtown Toronto, they helped uh, put uh, bring on the Toronto Symphony or Orchestra, uh, King Edward Hotel, uh, banking, railroads. They were very influential in many businesses that are large today across Canada. Uh, if you come to Toronto, some of you live here, like me, uh, as Gina mentioned, the distillery district is one of our neighborhoods in downtown Toronto. If there's a couple hundred neighborhoods, one is called the distillery district, and that's just how large their distillery had grown to be. It's an entire neighborhood now. So it's places where we have our holiday Christmas market, uh, lots of condos, lots of restaurants, bars, little shops to buy your dog clothes. But Outside of all of these businesses, it still looks like 1832 outside. It's quite amazing. Um, a lot of American movies filmed there. So it's a very special place to visit if uh, you're in Toronto. But let's try this whiskey. So the J.P. Weiser's 10-year-old, as we going on, it's very traditional. This is not a traditional style Canadian whiskey. So when we brought this expression back a few years ago, uh, I always say it's a perfect marketing and whiskey making uh, expression. Marketing goes to our whiskey makers at the distillery, vice versa. They come back, 
Dawn, our master blender, wanted to create something, an ode to Gooderham and Warts. And where there were grain millers, he wanted to make a four grain whiskey. And that's very uncommon in Canadian whiskeys. And back in 2016, when he produced it, you could even say it was pretty uncommon in North American whiskeys. So this is made up of corn, rye, wheat, and barley, seven distillates to be exact, four grains, seven distillates, um, and aged in two types of casks, 90% new American oak, 10% ex bourbon. I find myself nosing this and your first sip, you kind of walk through the four grains. When I nose it, I get a lot of breadiness from that wheat. Dave, can you remind everyone what we're tasting now? Oh, yeah, the the uh, Gooderham and Warts four grain. Sorry, I thought I'd said that at the beginning. So I'll let everyone catch up if you've got it poured out there. And again, join in on your notes of what you're, what you're nosing, what you're tasting. Uh, again, the majority of this is that soft corn, almost equal amount of a rye and little amounts of wheat and barley. So nosing it, I get the I get breadiness right away. A little bit of nuttiness. Certainly get some like red apples, lots of vanilla. Yeah, cinnamon on the nose, a, a lot of pot distilled rye in this. So you're gonna get the baking spices of that. Now the first sip. I always think it's gonna pack a little more of a punch. This is uh Dr. Dawn, some scientific uh, humor where it's a four grain whiskey. He bottled it at 44.4 ABV. Um, so 88.8 proof. We've noticed Gina and I traveling across the U.S. with this. Bourbon drinkers. When we're doing whiskey shows or cocktail festivals and you have a bourbon drinker that walks up to your table and, and tells you they don't like Canadian whiskey, they're bourbon drinkers, I usually respond, great, why are you here? But obviously, at that point, I want to change their mind. If we've got somebody who likes big, bolder whiskeys, I'll hand them off the Gooder Ham and Warts. And you usually see them, even if they're trying not to smile, they'll smile a little bit. You know they're enjoying it. Uh, this one is beautiful to sip on its own. Uh, one of my favorites to sip on its own. Ooh, almond croissant, apple strudel. I like that. But where this whiskey has been around, well, not this exact blend, but the brand has been around since the mid-1800s. Uh, you know, Canada is not very well known for classic cocktails uh, being originated here. But the first sour that was ever recorded was in 1856 in a saloon in downtown Toronto. Um, I'd like to think of that point where Gooderham and Warts was the local distillery in downtown Toronto, that sour might have been made with a spirit out of there. We have no proof of that, but uh, I certainly like to think that. So we'll use this when we're making whiskey sours. We'll use this when we're making Toronto cocktails, obviously, to be a little cheeky. Stands up with the amount of rye with some fernet and simple. Oh, pumpkin patch in the fall. I like that. But again, very easy to sip on. You get a lot of that spice from the rye. I'm getting, I always get a little red apple, but pancakes, that's also great too. <laughs> Almond croissant. See, I figured Gina was going to jump in at this point. I mean, I'm tasting along in the background here, but I'm getting ready for our, our next uh, topic. Absolutely. And I'm not seeing any questions necessarily come in, but I think they're they're following suit and they're they're we waiting have, to see what comes yeah, along. I do have a few. I can throw them up here. Okay. Um, let's see. This one came early on in um, in Gina's presentation. Um, when did they start adding corn? You know, honestly, it wasn't a. We couldn't give you a date. Like, and all of a sudden it was corn. Um, but really it, it kind of evolved, you know, through really through the mid to late 1800s, you start seeing more and more usage of corn versus wheat. Yeah. And 
I mean, think of it this way too. Like in Ontario, um, some of the biggest brands of Canadian whiskey in the world are made here in Ontario. Um, Harm Walker and Sons Distillery, like you say, we we put out a lot of whiskey every year. A uh, lot of corn in Ontario. I mean, Ontario is almost the size of Texas. We've got farms everywhere. Obviously, we produce rye, wheat, and barley as well, but majority corn. If you're to go to Alberta on, you know, west coast, western coast of Canada, rye is a lot more prominent. So there's a lot of whiskey makers that use rye, which we'll get into later, and Don will certainly deep dive into, um, which is interesting because if someone's using that rye because it's less expensive than corn, but they're still double column distilling it, which is stripping away a lot of the characteristics from the grain almost seems uh, pointless, but that's just my opinion. But there's no rule to using corn or the rye. Just corn is generally the predominant grain in Canadian whiskey because our access, the cost, um, you'll learn more. We buy everything locally, but if we have a wet summer in Ontario, for instance, local still means Illinois or Michigan that we can buy from the U S if it's got a better, uh, crop of grain that year. Awesome. Um, what's the reason that Canadian whiskey distills and matures the grain separately? So this is not a law. Um, it's more tradition, I think would be the way to say it. Would you not Gina? Um, mm -hmm. so if there's 10, eight to 10 large distilleries like Hiram Walker across Canada, there's probably close to 300 small boutique distilleries that are putting out some amazing things. This just, you're not going to see a lot of that make its way to across Canada or let alone the U S or outside of North America because they're smaller, but they're putting some really cool things together. I can't tell you if every single one of those distilleries is separating their grains. I mean, for us, you're going to learn a lot more from Dr. Don and where Canada has master blenders just because of this tradition. Imagine all of the grain showing up separately at our distillery, corn, rye, wheat, and barley fermented separately. You could distill it separately any way you choose, age it separately any way you want for a minimum three years, any type of cask. And this is where you blend. So you can make a lot of different expressions, which I don't want to get ahead. Gina's going to talk about category. So I'll just shut up on that right now. <laughs> well, we are going to dive into that next week in production. Yeah. So stay tuned because you'll get more on uh, the grains being produced separately next week. I'll leave it with this one and then Gina will jump back in to the presentation. Okay. So, yes, the current available in Canada and the U.S., this Gooder Hammond Works 4 grain is all that's available. Now, that's not say. We often put out um, different expressions annually. You'll always see a different type of cast strength lot 40 come up and JP Weiser's does a lot of different expressions and specialty uh, releases, very small quantities. Uh, Gooderham and Warts has released, we've released a few. I mean, there's this one here. Gooderham and Warts, 11 souls. It was based on um, the 11 children that Gooderham adopted, and this is an 11 distillate whiskey that Dr. Don made. So he can have a lot of fun with that. Unfortunately, that's not something you're going to find very easily right now. Um, but I hope in the future you'll see some more expressions come out. We've put out three different Gooderham and Wartz expressions probably in the last five years. Awesome. Uh, we do have a few more questions, but I'll just save those for the end. Um, okay if we have time and uh, let's jump back into it. All right. So let's dive into category regulations. What makes Canadian whiskey, Canadian whiskey? What are the rules, right? So, you know, a lot of what Dave and I run across and, and many people teaching about Canadian whiskey is that there are so many misconceptions about this whiskey category. So we thought we should kind of do a comparison uh, and you'll see this throughout the next four weeks back and forth between the US and Canada.
mostly because a lot of the misconceptions come from people believing that Canadian whiskey, for some reason, follows the same regulations as an American whiskey in some way, shape, or form. Uh, That is simply not true. Canada has their own set of regulations, just like Scotch, just like Irish whiskey or Japanese whiskey or what have you. Um, So let's learn about them to better understand this category. So looking at Canada versus the U.S., in Canada, there is only one regulated category. Every whiskey that is labeled a Canadian whiskey follows this one set of rules. In the U.S., federally speaking, we have over 36, and that is growing very quickly, uh, over 36 regulated categories, separately regulated categories of whiskey, blended whiskey, bourbon, straight bourbon, rye, straight rye. You, it, the list goes on and on and on, and I'm only talking about federally regulated, you know, not even including state regulated or regionally uh, regulated whiskeys as well. So big difference there. You know, I'm not going to list the names of all of the American whiskey categories, but in Canada, that one category is titled Canadian whiskey, Canadian rye whiskey, or rye whiskey. And that really shows me how important that rye grain became to Canadian whiskey, right? Now, each country... Both of them uh, recognize and adhere to international whiskey categories and their regulations, which means if Canada, if, if, they're, if the LCBO is selling a bourbon, if it's labeled a bourbon, it is h- adhering to American bourbon regulations. If you see a Canadian whiskey on the shelf in the U.S., it is adhering to Canadian whiskey regulations. And in Canada... It's national spirit is Canadian whiskey. In the U.S., bourbon is what we call America's native spirit. Okay, the regulations, the rules, here they are. First up is that it must be made from cereal grain. This is pretty standard across world whiskey. Rye, wheat, corn, barley, Pick a grain, you can make whiskey out of it. But whiskey is made from grain. It must be aged in wooden barrels, no more than 700 liters, for a minimum of three years. Now, it's not saying brand new oak or what type of wood. A minimum of three years. So right now, you know, Canada's aging laws are very much follow the same aging laws of scotch. Must be mashed, fermented, distilled, and aged in Canada. That seems so obvious. However, not so much. Again, if we think back and kind of compare to American whiskeys, that's not true for all American whiskeys. You know, there are many American straight ryes on the shelf that were produced in Canada. That rye whiskey was produced in Canada shipped to the U.S., aged and bottled, and it is labeled, able to be labeled, an American straight rye. In Canada, you cannot do that. If it is a Canadian whiskey, it is from mashing to aging uh, produced in Canada. The whiskey must be bottled at a minimum of 40% ABV. This, again, is pretty standard across most world whiskey categories. There's a few small exceptions here, but for the most part, when you buy a bottle of whiskey, whether it be American whiskey, scotch, Canadian whiskey, it's going to be a minimum of 40% ABV in that bottle. May contain spirit caramel for coloring. This is something not a lot of people like to talk about. Um, I don't know why. Most categories can do it. Canadian whiskey can add spirit caramel, scotch, Irish, Japanese. Most American categories, the exception here would be straight whiskeys, cannot add spirit caramel, but most of them can and do. Um, And it's really not something to hide. You know, it's 
it's done for a visual consistency on the shelf. You know, the barrels, depending on the weather changes or what's happening in the environment or even the wood, you know, the whiskey can come out a little different color. Same whiskey, same amount of time, same spot in the warehouse. It could look a little different. But we as consumers, we, we purchase things with our eyes, right? We look at things with our eyes first. And if my bottle of Guterham and Warts looks a little different than the last bottle that I bought at the same store, I suddenly think, uh, something must be wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just the color is a little inconsistent. Flavor compounds all still there. It's been tested. So in order to keep that visual consistency, distilleries will add a little spirit caramel. And by a little, I mean a little. This is, this is very debatable, but in my opinion, it is flavorless and odorless. Um, if you run it through many, many lab equipment, uh, machines in the lab, and we can talk to Dr. Don about this in week four, but um, you, you cannot detect it at all. It cannot be measured, spirit caramel, versus wood uh, compounds that are giving that coloring. Regardless, um, you know, it's a very little, little amount. You know, an example someone gave me one time was, if you were in a ballroom that was full of whiskey, you might only need to add a coffee cup's worth of spirit caramel to make that visual adjustment. So it's a very little amount. And finally, I'm running a little slow here. There we go. Uh, the 9.09% .09 rule. Now, this is where we see the most misconceptions about the category. So Canadian whiskey, up to 9.09% .09 of the liquid in the bottle can be either a minimum two-year age spirit or a wine. So it could be, you could add two years or more brandy, bourbon, tequila, uh, or you could add a wine. Why? Why, are the, why is this a regulation? Well, when we look back in our archives and the history of Canadian whiskey, you know, the blenders and Hiram Walker, we have some of his old blending books in our archives. They were doing exactly what innovation teams are trying to do today, which is gain more people into their whiskey category. So today we might see that in the form of flavored whiskeys, trying to bring, you know, people who like sweeter, fruitier things, making a peach flavored whiskey or something like that, uh, or apple flavored whiskey or what have you. Uh, trying to bring those drinkers into the category, right? But back in the day, they were trying to get brandy drinkers, rum drinkers to move into the whiskey category. And so they were blending things that were way more expensive. Cognac was more expensive. Rum was more expensive back then than the Canadian whiskey they were producing. But they were blending a little bit in to start to, to get those flavor profiles and those drinkers into the Canadian whiskey category. Now, as they saw the Canadian whiskey category grow exponentially, they were like, oh, we need to put some like boundaries on this so it doesn't go out of control or any distillers don't take advantage of this. So they decided for every 100 liters, you could add another 10 liters of either two-year age spirit minimum or wine. And that really set the regulation in place. So just to kind of reiterate, it cannot contain other ingredients. This is our biggest, biggest misconception on the category. I've had so many people say, oh, could we have neutral grain spirit? Canadian whiskey, it has neutral grain spirit in it. I don't want that. No, it does not. It legally can't. Not even the blended Canadian whiskeys cannot have juice, sugar, neutral grain spirit, or any other ingredients that wouldn't fall under that 9.09% .09 rule. And, you know, honestly, 
I don't know this, but my guess is that misperception comes from Americans in, in, in American blended whiskey. By regulation, American blended whiskey can have up to 80% neutral grain spirit. And a lot of them do. Uh, not, maybe not that much, but a lot of them do have some in there. Um, so I think maybe the misperception, because Canadian whiskey became so well known for being blended whiskeys, that that line just kind of got blurred of what you can do where. Um, but in Canadian whiskey, you cannot have any other ingredients. And finally, we are going to talk about flavored whiskey. Now, the these whiskeys don't fall under that Canadian whiskey category. It's its own category. We're going to touch on it because it is so important uh, to the market these days with RTDs and um, pre-made cocktails and all kinds of things. Uh, so we do want to touch on it, and we have some examples today. But again, Canada versus the U.S., what's allowed here? So in Canada, a flavored whiskey would have a sweetening agent of at least 2.5%. In the US, it could, could have sugar or a sweetening agent added or not, wouldn't have to. Bottled at a minimum of 23% in Canada, 30% in the US. So both lower than what we would see a whiskey bottled at, but a little different from country to country. And then this, this one's really vague because this is up for interpretation, um, but can contain natural or artificial flavorings, contains natural flavoring materials. What those materials are um, is kind of up for interpretation to a bit. And both can contain caramel coloring. So your juice, your sugar, your neutral grain spirits, or you know what have you for flavored whiskey are all okay. Okay, so now I'm going to pass it back to Dave uh, for another whiskey tasting. He's going to take us through three more whiskeys um, before we finish up here. Thank you, Dina. And uh, we realize we're going a little over, so we apologize to all of you that are on a tight schedule. If you have to leave, this is being recorded. We will get all questions answered. Um, next up, we're going to do the J.P. Weiser's 15-year-old. Now, this, too, is a traditional style of Canadian whiskey. That meaning the majority of this is that soft double column distilled corn. And I say with a little pinch of a rye whiskey, and that would be less than 5% rye in this blend. Um, age of the three types of casks, new American oak, ex-bourbon, ex-Canadian whiskey casks. And this is the one. We'll be going through 10 whiskeys over the next four weeks. This is the one whiskey where we take advantage out of our brands of that 9.09 .09 rule that Gina was talking about. We blend in a little bit of sherry to this whiskey, less than 2% to be exact. I want to say less than 1%, but definitely less than 2%, um, which, you know, on the nose right away, again, that soft double column distilled corn. Can you remind everyone what we're uh, tasting? Yes, I, I I did at the beginning. I was holding up the uh, there we go. Weiser's fifteen. Um, so again, that soft corn. You get the three types of cast. You're going to get the vanilla, toffee, caramel, warming notes, autumn spices, baking spices, cinnamon, clove, even a little bit of green apple, which we're going to get into uh, with. Um, a maturation ethyl acetate down the line, but after the 10 year mark that kicks in and I always get notes of pear or green apple to the whiskey. And I mean, sipping on it. Not a great amount and maybe it's just in my mind, but the, you know, little bit of sherry being blended in, I do get a bit of banana bread, a little bit of to tobacco and pecan off this. I find this whiskey, I mean, we always recommend this is one simply because of price point, best to sip on its own, a little water over ice, however you like it. If you want to make a cocktail, you're not going to upset us. Uh, DQ Heath Bar Blizzard. That's pretty good. Um, this is a crowd pleaser for me. Uh, summer months, if I'm going to live in Ontario, a lot of friends have cottages on lakes. If you're going to a cottage and you get some 
parents, uncles, grandparents, but younger generation too, this is uh, this is one that kind of pleases everybody, I find, uh, where it's light style, but you get a little bit of spice to it as well. Now, somebody just asked, what style of sherry? This is, I mean, by law, I can't say sherry because it's something that is made at the distillery in a pair of wine added in. So it's not like we're pairing up with a sherry company to make the whiskey. But this is something, you know, a lot of Canadian brands are even seeing some of our competitors, some cool brands in different parts of Canada are taking advantage of the 9.09 .09 rule. And they're advertising on their labels that they're blending in mezcals or you name it onto it. So it's a very cool rule to have. Um, I can't speak to other brands how much they put in. I can't speak to brands that don't share it. I will add, someone asked um, if we can, or if, yeah, if Canadian whiskey can do a two-year spirit and a wine, as long as it stays kind of under that 9.09% .09 limit. I haven't seen anyone do that, but they can by regulation. Saying, yeah, someone, somewhere along the line, someone asked that question too, uh, like at another thing we did. I've not heard of it, seen it. But as I say, yeah, you could do it. Um, you know what? Actually, I have heard of it. Uh, I did have a blend. I'm trying to remember what it was. But it was, um, it had whiskey, sherry, and bourbon. Oh, okay. Canadian rye, sherry, and bourbon. Um, oh, cool. And obviously, the sherry and bourbon were under the 9.09. .09. Oh, interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Should we go to the next? I know we're pushing it for time. Yeah. Yeah, and honestly, if we we're gonna answer a few more questions, you know, before we finish up here. But if we don't get to your question, Liz is gonna get us all these questions, and we will email our certification students. Um, or if you drop, if you're not one of our certification students watching, and drop your email, we we will email the answers to those questions out before next week. And she's not lying; she gets back to everyone. Um, and you know our. <laughs> Our Facebook group, I'm hoping it'll be just as interactive this year as it was last year with the students. So get on there, guys and gals. Like, we're going to, we'll be there. Um, next up, we're going to do our two ready-to-drink cocktails. First, we'll do the J.P. Weiser's Old Fashioned. As you all know, one of the world's top-selling cocktails over the last decade or so. I think it was number one. Uh, Negroni might have knocked it down to number two last year from Drinks International, but it's still doing pretty well. Um, mm -hmm. Marketing Dave would say, why bring a bottle of wine to the party when you can bring 13 pre-made cocktails with this drink? Like, we put this out there, not sure, not really knowing what would happen. This is before the pandemic, and it's been doing really well. So with the old-fashioned, it's pretty simple. It's a three-year-old corn whiskey. So the majority of our corn whiskey, double column distilled, minimum three years to be a Canadian whiskey, that is what is used in this. Uh, as far as sugar goes, we put 8% sucrose. We don't use fructose syrup. Um, Flavor House, we work with here in Ontario to match popular aromatic bitters goes into it. And... Uh, Dr. Dawn and the team at Hiram Walker put a little essence of orange as well. Just so if you're out for a camping night or someone's backyard pool party and you don't want to bring some oranges around, we've already taken care of it for you. Um, Pre-diluted it to 35 ABV, 70 proof. And I mean, it's a light bronze color. You're probably looking at it. Right away, I always get those like orange rinds off of it. Cinnamon little bit of nutmeg, some spices, uh, but it's what you think it is. It's a light styled old fashioned. Myself personally, it's one of my go-to drinks. I'm usually going to do a big rye whiskey, but this has been a crowd pleaser. People have been enjoying it. Really easy to sip. Obviously, this is not something Gina and I work with quite often. We don't go, we work mostly with bars and restaurants. We're not bringing in pre-made cocktails, but when we work with retailers across the U.S. or Canada, um, 
especially as of the last few years, ready to drink cocktails have been doing quite well. There is one company yeah, and- in Canada that puts this on tap and sells it. It's a pizza chain in Canada that goes through this. They, instead of making their own, they use it. Talk about consistency, huh? There you go. Um, and, and just so everyone knows, and maybe Dave already touched on this, I've been kind of reading through the comments, but you know, the reason we're taking, we're taking you through just a couple ready to drink cocktails is they fall under the flavored whiskey regulations. So they're, they're technically flavored whiskeys. They're not flavored to be an old fashioned or a Manhattan. Um, they are an old fashioned and a Manhattan, but they don't follow that 9.09% rule. They fall into the, um, flavored whiskey category exactly thank you uh hence i mean we're putting sugar in this so there's eight percent sucrose in that so it couldn't be a canadian whiskey it has to be a flavored canadian whiskey now next up we're going to do the jp weiser's manhattan this was something once the old-fashioned took off and started doing so well with consumers naturally the company said what can we do next uh, Manhattan made sense as it's always a top 10 selling cocktail around the world. And same thing, 3% corn, or sorry, three-year-old corn, uh, sweet vermouth, flavor house for the bitters, same bitters, pre-diluted to 35 ABV, 70 proof. I mean, it's a dark caramel brown as most Manhattans are. I get like a little bit of cherry wood on the nose. Some toasted malts, lots of like sweet vanilla and cinnamon. And I actually get like a little white pepper almost, maybe a little like sweet honey when I sip on it, which might sound weird for a Manhattan, but that's what I'm getting. Um, Someone very autumn nutmeg, orange spice vines, like that. See, we should probably get you guys to help us write some of the tasting notes. It's mostly Dr. Dawn, but... Uh, <laughs> Someone asked, um, kind of going back a little bit to the sherry conversation, if you can call it sherry in Canada or if it needs to be called a para. A para, yeah. I mean, it's. I've even heard some rumblings in the industry, which I don't think you and I have even talked about, Gina. I think they're going to be some new rules set globally, internationally about sherry. I just say sherry finish because honestly, it, comes across more naturally to a consumer if you're talking about that. Uh, but yes, it's an apparel one. And honestly, I think the regulation actually got set that Sherry specifically comes from Spain. Um, I Don't quote me on this. I want to say 2014, but somewhere around there. So before that time period, and guys, Dave's old school, uh, before that old. time period, you could call it Sherry in yeah. Canada. Um but that regulation got set, and so now it would be called an apparel wine. Yes. I mean, same. Well, not to get off topic, same thing goes. I bought a bottle of port that was made in a country that was certainly not Portugal a few years ago, and it was port. You know, I'm not going to get into that. Uh, ratios of vermouth to whiskey. As far as I know, the only thing that I had to do with creating this blend was putting together a Manhattan. So, I mean, it would be two whiskey, one part vermouth, a couple dashes of bitters. Well, that's, that's what it should be in this bottle. Now, again, this is light-styled corn whiskey. So, the vermouth's going to shine through a lot more than it would if it was a big rye whiskey. Cherry bell in that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Lots of almond, you're right. Lots of almond in a few of these tasting notes, but I, I don't disagree with that, to be quite honest. Uh, well, I think, should we take one more question and then kind of wrap it up and we'll get back to everyone. Anyone we didn't answer your question, we'll go through them in the next couple of days and, and get the answers to you for sure. Ah, here's a great one. Does pairing the vermouth with the spirit keep it good and in perpetuity <laughs> or do these bodies have an bottles have an expiration date Woo! i can do it 
You're right so there. These bottles have an expiration date. I do. I took a drink of water. That's going to help. Uh, they don't have an expiration date. No. Nope. So the vermouth, you know, is fortified with the whiskey. So that's certainly helping the bottling. And of course, extensive testing has been done on shelf life on that. Absolutely. All right. I think we should probably pass it back to Liz um, to finish up here. And then, like I said, we'll get any questions we didn't get to today uh, from the chats. We will certainly get to you all in the next few days. I have all of them starred. It looks like most of them came from our students. So, um, and we have a two hour class tomorrow. So mm -hmm. if you want to save some questions for then, feel free, but I've got them all recorded. So Gina and Dave will have all of these questions that are unanswered um, and they'll be able to get back to all of you on that. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, first class in the books. It was a great one. Um, we did go over a little bit, but I've had a couple people ask if this is being recorded. Yes, it is recorded. Um, whatever platform you are watching it on right now, Facebook or YouTube, um, this video recording will live there forever. So if you missed part of it or you want to go back and review, please go do that. And while you're there, give it a like. Um, that always helps and just feels good to me and Gina and Dave. Um, makes us feel like we're doing something right. So appreciate it. Um, join us back here next Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern for the second week of Canadian whiskey certification classes. Um, but for our students, you'll join us tomorrow in your private workshop at 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, so looking forward to that. And again, thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next week. Thanks, Gina and Dave. Thanks, Liz. And Thanks, Craig. everybody. Thanks, everybody. Mm -hmm. Awesome. See you Bye. soon. Bye.